Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and this episode, my co-host Ryan and I welcome Neil Powell, most notably from Dungeon Master's Block podcast. He is also the editor for Whelmed, the Young Justice Files, and the brand new Tentacles and Tomes podcast, a Call of Cthulhu actual play podcast. We also have with us Tall Squall, who plays Alistair on Turncloak's actual play podcast. And along with this, he is the DM for The Vice, a 100% ch- for charity actual play campaign on Twitch. And we are here to discuss character creation for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, a fantasy role-playing game system published by Wizards of the Coast. And welcome to the first episode, everyone. Uh, we're very excited to have you all here with us. Well, thank you. Uh, looking forward to uh, create some characters and uh, show off some of the fun things that 5th edition has to offer. I really thought this was going to be 2nd edition. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to calculate some Thacko. No, wait. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> back Start in my over. day, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, Neil, uh, could you go ahead and tell us a bit more about yourself and uh, anything else you want to talk about the projects that you're currently involved in? Uh, no, that was a good rundown. That also means that Tall Squall, you and I are encounter role play friends, and we are officially meeting for the first time. Yes, because I, I edit tomes and titicles. Yeah, well, welcome to welcome to the fold of Will's madness. Or actually, I guess you get to watch Will be tormented instead of tormenting us. Yes, it is enjoyable, and uh, I think the only other thing that I would put out there because I just started doing it is I started a blog series called From LP to RP where I take album covers and I create fifth edition content based off of like whatever inspires me about them. And it's really fun. And so if no one else likes it, I really do. And I think that's all that really matters. Yeah, I checked out that, I checked out that first blog entry and it, it's pretty sweet. Uh, I'm really excited for the rest of them. Awesome. It's such a neat project idea. Like, that's- Yeah, no, I, I, I saw it come across my feed and I'm like, what is this? And I'm like, this is cool. Awesome. <laughs> I started thinking back all of my album covers, right? Yeah. I know I tried starting to like scroll through my brain too to think of ones that would be interesting too, but well, I didn't you, come up with anything so you far. let me know. And I can I'll, I'll always let you use know if I... more inspiration. Yes. That's all I have. All right. <laughs> all right. And um, thank you for being here, Neil. Um, and Tall Squawk, can you tell us a little bit more about what else you have going on? Sure. Yeah. No, uh, other than being, uh, like I said, tormented with. Um, the fun and excitement of turn cloaks, which is our sort of low magic campaign where I'm playing a plague doctor, which is sort of how we've described uh, a cleric. He's of the de- of the uh, grave domain in this really low magic world. We've made great pains, or at least I've, I've tried to do my best to make science uh, match these spells. So they're not necessarily uh, straight off of the uh, the descriptions that you might find in the player's handbook. And that's certainly been a fun challenge, creative uh, thing to do. Um, but I really enjoy that. It is dark though. So if you're, that's not your cup of tea. Uh, we have the vice that you had mentioned that I uh, DM. We do run it a hundred percent for charity. Uh, we've been going for a little bit over a year now, and we've raised, uh, we're approaching $8,000 that we've raised oh, wow. for awesome. uh, about 10 different charities. Uh, we actually have a table of charities that has been submitted by uh, our players and our uh, regular viewers, and we roll each month of what charity we're going to support. And I've uh, been able to, as I say, almost $8,000 now that we've raised. So I'm really uh, pleased with that. It's been amazing to learn more about charities that I wasn't aware of and then be able to give them some support from the amazing role-playing community out there. Uh, just far more generous and far more giving than I think any of us could have ever expected. And it's just been really neat uh, thing to see and be a part of. Um, the other fun thing we have going on right now, if you want something really on the lighter side, yeah. uh, right now, <laughs> Learn by Play, which is on the D&D Twitch channel on Saturday nights at 6. Uh, Will is DMing. It's called uh, Reinventing the Realms. It's taking uh, the Realm of Faerun and throwing in some homebrew into it. Uh, we're starting at level one. And uh, we are a... We, we were making our characters interesting. So we were going through our characters. And everyone sort of was like, oh, we want to try out some of these great new classes that are out in some of the new materials. And we all did. 
And then we also were all being quirky and whatever and rolling stats and putting together our, our character story. And we didn't realize until about halfway through session one, every single one of us has int as our dump stat. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Lit- I mean, we were, I was like, one of those things I was like, I had rolled something and it was like, you had a minus one. Someone else rolls it. I was like, a minus two. Then someone else rolled it. I said, zero. I'm like, I sent out a message madly through our chat. I'm like, did everyone take <laughs> intelligence as a dump oh, no. stat? And everyone's like, yep, 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 yep. And we're like, oh, wow. This and this is-, is the important of session zero, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we are you know, on the D&D channel with a group uh, that is, yeah, going to be all about hitting the charisma and just hitting things hard. <laughs> yep, I was like, you are the hammer. That yeah. sounds amazing, but uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's been very fun. It's a very interesting, um, you know, a whole different you know type of gameplay. Uh, the you know one of the things Will had said uh, is that you know it's about these wild cards after the events of Tomb of Annihilation, and so we are now known as the wild cards because we're all the you, know, you always have the one quirky member of the party. We're all the quirky members. It's like if that was all that was left over, <laughs> that and was you just all made that a group of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's been a lot of fun. But um, yeah, so those are sort of the things that I'm involved with. Uh, you can find me on Encounter Roleplay doing Encounter Roleplay things, uh, one shots and other campaigns that I'm involved with. But uh, yeah, no, it's you know it's all about getting together and telling a story. And the biggest piece of that is character creation. So I'm looking forward to uh, taking people through a little bit of how we do it here. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here as well, Tall Squall. Well, how about we uh, jump in to find out what this game is actually all about before we get to the character creation. What's in a game? So we are going to open the floor to answering a few questions. Uh, So feel free, you guys, to jump in and discuss wherever you feel comfortable. Dungeons and Dragons, we know it's popular. What is the standard Dungeons and Dragons setting for, for some that might not be familiar with it that may be listening right now. Um, well, I mentioned it before. I mean, it's Forgotten Realms, Faerun. Um, I actually am not a big modern lore buff. I know those two pieces, and I go to, you know, <laughs> I go out onto Google when I need <laughs> to know things. So I'm going to, that's, there's the end of my knowledge on that one. So I'll step back and let <laughs> someone else talk. <laughs> well, like, what sort of uh, setting? It's, it's a fantasy setting, right? With uh, dungeons, dragons, castles, monsters, magic, etc. Um, anything that uh, kind of steps or stands out to you guys that that might make it a little bit more uh, apart from just a regular standard fantasy game. In terms of the Forgotten Realms, I know one of the big things. So I probably have too much knowledge and won't go that road either. Is but. Even despite all of that and all the years it has been around, it does a decent job of having empty spaces in which you can exist. You know, there's a lot of very clearly defined things and depending on the players at your table, that can be good or bad. When (laughs) I'm in Waterdeep, they're like, okay, three blocks down is this, uh, this bar and this shop. Probably (laughs) not great, but you can also go off into these uncharted wilds that can be anything that you want them to be. Um, some other places are so defined that you don't feel like you have that freedom. I think that's kind of how I think of D and D generally is that it's more of an open sandbox kind of world where you can fit in the pieces that you want. It has this generic fantasy feel, but there's you know all these other pieces that you can kind of create yourself and your players can add in. You know, some settings have like a very strong meta plot or very like specific. You know, like you said, like three blocks down is this, and then there's this, and you know, like I think of D and D as being much more open. Well, and I think it's that flexibility, um, and with I think we're at forty some odd years of lore, there is a lot of breadth that you can use, um, and that's nice for both dungeon master and player that you have this built in familiarity with um, with this land, but for a level one adventurer, you know, you step too far off the road and it can be any forest, anywhere, any creature, um, you know, in any fantasy realm that you want it to be. So, um, 
I think that's kind of one of the things that I know a lot of people who have played even some of the video games that are based off of the lore. It's interesting to see people you may have met uh, and not even realized it was something that was Dungeons and Dragons. I was actually just talking to someone today that I'm starting a Curse of Strahd uh, campaign, which I've kept myself completely sequestered from waiting for the group to play it. Because <laughs> I, you know, everyone talks about how amazing it is. And so I didn't want to know anything, no spoilers. I didn't want to run it. I've never opened the book. Uh, I know the very, very basics from the fact that I know Ravenloft, you know, mm. the video game. And so, and I was mentioning someone did it, and he was like, I didn't realize that that was, you know, that was all part of that. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that's, it's all interconnected. And a lot of people don't even realize how interconnected, you know, that Baldur's Gate is, you know, they know that series. And I'm like, what do you mean that's D&D? It's like, no, that's D&D. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think that there's a, there's a bit of that nostalgia. And I say, you know, the built-in feels that you can sometimes play on with people um, in these, in these worlds which is which is nice. Yeah, I think it, it by now because it's been around so long and there are so many, you know, different pieces of it. It offers a nice balance between um having a lot of stuff to work off of if you're the kind of person that doesn't want to completely write your own story and you know, you need a little uh a little structure. Um it has it has that and then if you're the kind of person that wants to completely make up your own thing, there's certainly room for that too. Right. In this world or creating your whole world. I mean, that's the nice part about the reference levels that you have with fifth edition and even previous editions, I think, is the fact that you've got that ability to, I think in the DM guys, it's, you know, it has you start with a pantheon of gods, you know, to truly start at, you know, in the beginning <laughs> type right. yes. level this of This is creation. your genesis. Um, or just down to, well, I, we're going to get together for this party, you know, or we're going out, you know, hiking, uh, and we're going to, you know, be, have a weekend and we're going to play D and D's at night because there's no TV in the cabin type idea. <laughs> and you can go like, okay, here's a couple monsters. Everyone, you know, quick make a character and let's roll some dice. And I think it, it lends itself to either type of play. Mm-hmm. So. I think the next step then in creating our characters is to say, what things do we need? What material things do we need to get this done? What do you need to have in front of you? Uh, a piece of paper, <laughs> piece of paper, <laughs> yep. pencil, uh, truly for just character creation and a six sided die, um, you know, from any Monopoly game anywhere or whatever might you have in your house. Uh, certainly it helps if you've got more. So if you've got a Yahtzee set, go get a couple. But, um, <laughs> you know, if you really get right down to it, um, and then of course, uh, player's handbook, or as I was mentioning earlier, I have discovered the, the fun and excitement that is D and D beyond, uh, on the web, which is a great tool because literally you can log into it. If you've got internet, you can get to it and you can create a character. Yeah. It does all its calculations for you and everything from what I understand. Yep. Yeah. For, for those of us who are math averse. <laughs> oh yeah, it you can like a- do I mean, I would almost say not not that this is by any means my approach as I've been playing for far too long and spent way too much money on physical items to go this road, but if you wanted to, if you have a smartphone, you are ready. You are ready to play, you are ready to roll dice, you are ready to do everything from the comfort of your own two thumbs. And I mean, honestly, at this point with like all the, the D and D beyond stuff and the dice roller apps, although I've had terrible luck with those, I feel <laughs> like it's out to get me, but that's my own paranoia. Um, but I, I think that's all you would really need, but definitely I would, the feel of actual dice cannot be beat though. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of actual real physical dice and a little bit superstitious about mine that I have a set that, they're beautiful and I love them, but they roll terribly and they can't touch the other dice now. Yeah. Like they've, they've been put in the corner on timeout. They're not allowed. Dice, dice jail. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. And, and when you're actually playing the game, uh, you're going to need a little bit more than just your D6s. Uh, you'll probably need some percentile dice uh, so you can roll between 1 and 100. Uh, you'll need you know, an 8-sided die, a 12-sided die, and so on. Um, pretty much uh, everything from a six four sided die to a twenty sided die really um, will get you by when you're actually playing the game. But again, you can you know 
do the internet too. Yep. There's a, there's a lot of apps for that. Yeah. <laughs> so when we get down to it, uh, when we create our characters, what do our characters do in a and d game? How, how do you play with these characters? That is not a small question. Not yeah, a small I was question. Say, <laughs> how much time do you want us to take on this one? Oh, uh, we've got time. No, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think quickly defining the role of the person running the game and then referencing back on top of that, you know, and so someone is running, if you will, the world, and it is the players that then interact with that. And whatever that may mean, you have some tools at your disposal to do that. It could be that none of your party have very much <laughs> intelligence and they <laughs> smash things. Or it could be that none of your party has any strength. And instead, they try and outthink things. I mean, so it's really just interacting with the world in the way that the players want to. Yeah, I mean, to get into, I've, I've actually had to explain this a couple times to friends who, as I've re returned <laughs> to D&D, &D, my D&D &D roots, um, I took almost, gosh, two decades off uh, between <laughs> when I played in college and now suddenly playing again. Like, you know, this entire weekend, I think I've got close to like 26 hours of D&D &D planned. Oh, wow. Um, Sounds like a good weekend. Yeah, yeah, no exactly. A it's a great weekend. So, um, you know, I had a friend who has absolutely no idea, doesn't play <laughs> any type of games that involve character creation or any type of stats or anything. It's like, so explain to me stats, explain to me what attributes are type thing. And, you know, so I, being an engineer, I went into engineer mode. I was like, you know, it's a way to capture the infinite variety of human beings into a set of numbers. And uh, she at first balked at that. And she goes, that's a horrible thing. How can you possibly put people into numbers? <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 no. The, the idea is, you know, and I gave her some examples, you know, a, a bodybuilder, you know, or a, uh, actually, you know, if you really, really go into the true strength of it, you know, like a power lifter, you know, they are, have developed their strength for whatever, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, and it's showing that they are very strong. So, and an 18 is your natural limit to that before very specific training or whatever, uh, you know, if we get into the real nitty gritty of the rules. You know, dexterity, you know, a gymnast, someone who's very agile, someone, you know, or a dancer. And that, you know, she, her being a dancer, she, she I got her with that one. I was like, you know, <laughs> you know, you're dancers, you know, and even, and I was explaining to her, you know, <clears throat> not every dancer can do, you know, can do what they do at the, you know, at the New York ballet. You know, also every ballet dancer doesn't necessarily know how to do tap. So, you know, you've got that whole type of piece or, uh, she always talked about the hardest thing she ever did was the dance, you know, doing Sugar Plum Fairy, you know, for uh, the Nutcracker. That that's like one of the most difficult, most strenuous. Bits. Like now, here's where you get into. That's where you would have a high dex, high constitution. This is someone who's got the endurance to build through it. So I just kept on giving out lots of examples like that of how you can quantify. Now we get into much more soft territory with intelligence and wisdom, trying to make that differentiation. And then charisma is the one that everyone likes to argue about, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, you yeah, that that's always been an interesting one. I always uh, think of uh, charisma as your ability to influence, not necessarily your attractiveness, which I think, you know, attractiveness un in, our, in most societies will sometimes lend to influence, but does not necessarily mean that you are going to be able to influence better than some others. Yeah, I think in, in real life examples, um, charisma would be your politicians, your people that can kind of um, talk their way out of things and maybe aren't the most good looking, but they, they know how to, <laughs> how to was, give a speech. <laughs> that was go going to be my exact argument was if <laughs> it truly were how visually stunning you were, we would have a lot more attractive presidents. That's yeah. all I was yes. thinking. <laughs> well, my, my example for that always is Stephen Hawking. Oh yeah, you know, Stephen Hawking has truly can influence the world with his opinions. But you know, he, there's there's your almost you know example of maybe a two decks, you know, great int, mm -hmm. actually probably great wisdom for being able to you know at this point in his life and living with the hardships he's have. But you know, most people would just by looks would go, well, no, he you know that's low charisma. It's like no. He's actually probably like an 18 charisma because here's someone with all of these other disadvantages but still the world stops and listens to it 
Mm-hmm. You know, so I always like to use that as my example of charisma not necessarily being what you think it is. Yeah, definitely. That uh, that really sums things up very well for all the different stats. I like that. You guys did a way better job than we did when we were trying to <laughs> sort out exactly how to explain all of them. <laughs> That's why well, we invite the professionals. I was going to say, I have way too much time on a podcast and playing D&D, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's purely attrition, not skill. <laughs> I, I think also once you've DM. Once you once you've you know, been a dungeon master, a game master, and had to make those calls, especially those wisdom versus intellect calls, uh, you know, of what check you really want to get, uh, gets interesting. And sometimes, you know, we won't get into this in character creation, but in running the game, you can sometimes swap out even what is the the recommended attribute for a check. Religion's my one where I always. Uh, usually find myself doing a swap specifically for paladins and druids uh, who are wisdom and charisma religious based casters but religion is about your book learning of your religion um and so but when you're talking about it, your affinity with your god it should be based on those stats that those spells are being cast from wisdom or charisma I'm mean, sorry, I'm getting way out of character creation world now. No, that's fine. <laughs> Don't mind me as I ramble on about <laughs> you know. That was I'm not gonna lie though, that was a fantastic idea and I'm stealing it, so now you know. It's like oh. got a notebook over there writing it yep. down. <laughs> Coming soon to a gymnastics near you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so one more question we we want to talk about before we get into like the history, the in you know, the parts of it that we haven't necessarily covered yet is what do you think makes D&D unique as a game? Like why would you play D&D over any other role-playing games out there? I think one of the biggest things that makes it unique now is its prevalence and the support that that brings. I you know my first thought was oh it's versatility but I don't think that that's what truly makes it unique in that you can really find an RPG that fits exactly what you're looking for that isn't D&D. But the fact that um, probably over a hundred thousand people tuned in to watch the first episode of season two of Critical Role, and nice. yeah, there we go. <laughs> it, we got critters in our midst, and I the fact I, that they're on I billboards. Feel like we're all wearing like appropriate. No, t-shirt. no, got... mine's just a super cool looking owl. Oh, nice! I've, I've got yeah. one on that's a little bit appropriate for one of our guests. So. Hey! Oh, yeah. shirt. <laughs> This nice. is really great for our audio medium. Everybody can see that we're all wearing. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> I'm wearing a blue critical roller shirt. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I, really it's that. I mean, if you look at then the ce- all the celebrity games that are the celebrities that are involved in games, Joe Maganello has embraced his origins in D&D and we are all better people for it. <laughs> and just the number of people that are like coming out and coming forward to, in support of that, allowing it to be, I mean, in a lot of ways, the RPG gateway drug. And it's just going to be the tide that raises all ships, I think is the thing that really makes D&D stand out right now. Yeah, I think there's that, like you're saying, there's this instant sense of community and connection that you can get when saying, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I've got a and d game this weekend. Um, and a lot of times, unfortunately, it, it, uh, for people who don't play, it's become almost like the, you know, like I, I'm drinking a Coke, even if you're drinking a Pepsi, mm-hmm. you know, yep. or Kleenex, you know, instead mm-hmm. of tissue, you know, uh, because it is just the generic RPG term these days. But I think that level that immediately goes into when someone invites you and say, it's your first, you've never played before and someone invites you over. I mean, uh, again, you pop it into Google and you can see, you know, Vin Diesel playing D and D. You can play, you know, uh, you know, you can see, you know, anyone's Twitter uh, that you're know, blowing up talking about that they're doing their game. You know, certainly this thing called Critical Role will show up, and you turn that on, and you'll hear, you know, you're an Overwatch player, and suddenly you're you're hearing the voices of the people who play Overwatch, or you know, you play WoW, and suddenly Illidan Stormrage is rolling dice. You know, <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of a cool thing. I mean, there's this instant connection. That you get and that helps you. I think, you know, especially today in our world, there is so much need for people to find a community and some, a group to sort of, uh, identify with to step away a little bit. 
And while you can get some of that in like a World of Warcraft or uh, an Overwatch, or I, I need to think of something other than Blizzard Project, but <laughs> you know, Call of Duty, uh, you know, any of those types of games, there is, I think, a, a, you know, this built in with with Dungeons and Dragons. You know, there's so many places you can go on and be like, I just want to play a game. I want to play with other people. I want to have you know this face to face connection with folks. And while there's great other systems out there. I think there's system there's systems that I just love that I've played and really enjoyed playing. But when it comes to new players, new you know meeting new people, going to conventions, you know, there's a quick, immediate vocabulary of what you're to expect from a Dungeons and Dragons game. Whereas with Numenera might not be the case, or I can't, I mean, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think of other systems that I've played, but. Yeah, it's, it's really the gateway drug of RPGs. It's, I mean, that's Mm -hmm. how I always describe it. That's part of why we picked this for our first episode. It's, I mean, it's sort of ubiquitous and, you know, I, I do have that problem of like being at work and saying, Oh, I'm going to go play whatever this weekend. And people say, I don't know what that is. I'm like, ugh, it's like D and D. It's, you know, you just have to like, you're like, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's like D&D. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then suddenly we know what you're talking about. And now we've got all sorts of pop pop culture references to D&D and things like Stranger Things and whatnot, uh, where it's becoming super popular just to to have it in kind of a more front and center portion of our culture instead of, oh, it's those nerds in the basement playing D&D and rolling their dice. And and summoning things or whatever. Oh yeah, uh, I totally to bought this D and D shirt at Target, like just yeah. right out there in the front of the women's section. Like, yeah, you right. don't have to go to a specialty store to get geeky D and D t shirts anymore. It's mm-hmm. it's there. We've done it. No, haha. <laughs> 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 uh-huh. We finally the nerds win. <laughs> <laughs> you can't shove us back in the basement now. <laughs> Definitely not. But it's it's funny because you know D and D has been around for over forty years, like we said, and it was actually originally released in nineteen seventy four. So that's uh that's a bit older than myself, and I'm usually uh pretty old in in my current circles. And it's gone through uh five editions so far, and each one's been a uh, a bit different from each other edition. I think one and two might have been somewhat similar, but I'm not familiar with first edition at all. Um, I, I kind of grew up starting with the rules of second edition and uh, went from there to third edition, 3.5. Um, skipped over fourth edition because this was after college when my life uh, went completely to working and not playing, unfortunately. But uh, fifth edition is the current edition of Dungeons and Dragons, and that's the one that we're planning to use today. Yes, and we are using it because it's current. We are not making any assessments right now about which edition <laughs> is better. Please don't email us or tweet us or whatever. Oh, all edition your, wars. Let's all do your this. Opinions, I will come right out and say that this is actually the only edition I've ever played. Um, I only started playing D and D like a year ago. And I played for about four months, um, so I am the least experienced of us here. So we won't judge you. That's okay. It's okay. It's, okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I know. There's a there's a few more terms that we probably need to cover for our audience uh, that may not be familiar with things uh, before we actually dive into character creation. Um, I know Tosca, you covered the ability score descriptions perfectly. So thank you for that. And speaking of which, the ability scores, mechanically, they are the things that determine how good you are at certain tasks, using certain skills, uh, casting spells for certain classes, things like that. Um, And basically, the higher the score that you have, the higher your modifier is. And the modifier is what you add on to your role in order to determine what your result is for that check. And basically, the the skill proficiencies, uh, everybody basically has access to all of the skills in Dungeons & Dragons, but the proficiencies tell you that you're a little bit better at it, you're trained in it, and you get what is called a proficiency bonus that you add on top of your ability modifier. 
that way uh, you get a, a little bit more of a boost and that bonus actually increases with your levels as well. Anything else that we might have uh, missed in terms of the, the basic terms that we would need to cover for character creation? I don't think so. I think the only thing that we, as a collective unit, and I say this mostly to myself, um, is to watch out for using abbreviations. Because I'm ready to say con and dex right. all day long. <laughs> <laughs> just in case people don't know what those are. Right. We That's can just, in editing, insert into the recording one of us saying, every time you say, yeah. con, constitution. Con, constitution. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I like it. Nice robotic voice. <laughs> there you go. Yes. <laughs> what did you get for constitution? <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Well, are you guys ready to dive in? Sure. Should we make some people? Let's make yes. some people. Let's make some people. Awesome. Let's make some people. All right. So um, does anybody, to start, do you guys have um, any things that you specifically want to make? Do you have preferences here? I mean, I, just, I haven't gone deep into it and certainly can change it out. I was thinking again, since we're gearing this towards beginners uh, or folks who've not created before, I was going to go with um, what I actually think is kind of one of the great unsung classes it is to build your your basic fighter, uh, you know that to, you know it, it is kind of always done as the well you know fighters are boring they never have a story uh, you know it, they're just the fighter you know and uh, I think that people overlook some of the really unique things that you can do when uh, telling a story and playing as a fighter. Um, I. I I uh, I try tend to approach a little bit D and D maybe differently. I'm not sure than everyone else. My campaigns and the games that I play in are very heavily narrative based. Uh, you know, we might have a combat once every three, four, five, half dozen sessions, and the rest of it will be either political encounters or interaction between the world and the players. So from you know, people normally, like I said, with a fighter, are like, you know, that's just your flat out combat class. They don't have much of a story to tell through the mechanics, but I'm here to hopefully prove people otherwise with some of the things that I like to do. Uh, and uh, like I say, one of the great unsung classes. So I was going to make a fighter. All right. Nice. Neil, do you have a preference here? I do. And I feel like Tall Squall and I are going to approach this in a similar manner with their very different ideas and i will make what i believe is my favorite car uh, race class combo with a dwarf cleric and a lot of people also say like oh no essentially like oh you showed up late you have to play the cleric oh no <laughs> <laughs> you showed up late and the only power left over is heart i'm sorry <laughs> everyone everyone else has super cool abilities oh, we need a healer but <laughs> yeah yeah but I, and I think more so even in 5th edition than other editions, the cleric can be a ton more than just like a heal bot or just, just any of the preconceived notions. Um, like I just played the starter set with my wife and, and one of her friends recently, and I was unstoppable with Sacred Flame um, as a first level cleric. So I'm going with Dwarf Cleric. Very nice. All right. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I, I am a... I Cleric and Paladin are my go-tos. I, I love playing, being the healer. <laughs> All right. And what about you, Ryan? You have you have a plan yeah. here? Um, I kind of uh, was wanting to do kind of either a tanky thing or a damage-dealing thing. Um, I'm not too particular about exactly which one to go with. And I think I'm going to play it by ear. But I think I'm leaning a little bit more towards the damage-dealer type. All right. I, in true Amelia fashion, um, I'm going to go with the charisma style play, and uh, I am going to pick a bard. Nice. You will sing our tales or not. Another <laughs> preconceived notion is that all bards are singing and doing stuff like that. True. Uh, again, does not have to be that. Could be terrible jokes. <laughs> it's true. This bard is my is favorite approach. Stand up comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, because bards they cast their magic with like uh, song and and 
vocals and whatnot, I, I usually think of. But I, I imagine that they could use their inspiration or cast their inspiration and all that other stuff through comedy and however you want to flavor the character, which is uh, pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, you just have to be uh, a naturally comedic person to play a <laughs> character like that because you don't want to have your party not be laughing at your really lame jokes. This bard only tells dad jokes. Yes. Hey, I would laugh. <laughs> to create a character, we have to determine the, the ability scores uh, that we talked about earlier. And there's three main methods to cover for rolling up our ability scores, so to speak, in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, there's the tried and true method of simply rolling for them. And in 5th edition, uh, rules as written is you take four six-sided dice, roll them, remove the lowest value die, and then add up the remaining three. Do that six times, and now you got six numbers to assign to whichever abilities you wish for your character. Um, another option is the standard array. Uh, this is just a standard set of six ability scores that do not change um, from the start. Uh, and it's anywhere from a score of eight all the way up to 15. But the nice thing about this is you really only have one score that's below average, and it's really not below average that much. So you're above average pretty much overall for your character, and you don't have to worry about rolling really low compared to the rolling method. Also means that everybody's kind of working off of the same set of stats rather than you know, mm -hmm. having somebody who has really poor luck or you know, somebody who's <laughs> just really great at everything. Yeah, it's really good for party balance if, if you want to go that route. Um, another route to go is a little bit more math intensive. It's the point buy system. Basically, you get 27 points and you're able to spend them according to a certain chart. Uh, you can have a score from 8 costing 0 points all the way up to 15 costing 9 points. Uh, with this method, you could end up with scores such as 315s and 38s. Or you could go really balanced with 313s and 312s and pretty much anywhere in between um, as long as you can use all 27 of your points. Um, and it's worth noting, you can actually recreate the standard array with the point buy system if you truly intended to. So uh, if your DM locks you into point buy, but you really wanted the standard array, well, you're in luck. You can do that still. <laughs> So what I was kind of thinking for our character creation, how about um, each of us take one of these methods, if you have a preference, and um, one of us will, will choose whichever one we want at that point, since we got four people here. So, uh, Tosqual, what, what method do you prefer normally? Um, I usually do 4d6, but I'm happy to take something else if someone else wants to roll. Um, but if no one else wants to, to, to play, the, play the fates, I will be happy to do so. <laughs> All right, how about you, Neil? Um, I usually like, because I do a, a, a lot of games online when it comes to D&D, &D, I will actually go with the point buy and kind of take that one on. Wonderful. And Amelia? Um, I'm going to go with the one that involves the least amount of math and pick the standard array. Fantastic. So that means I get to choose whatever I want, and I'm with Tosqual. I'm going with Roland. Nice. I love. I don't get me wrong though. I love me some rolling because at my home game, I actually came up with a personalized system where you take forty six for each attribute, but you can move them around. So you essentially have like a pseudo dice pool. So you have so you could oh. choose to only roll three die, three dice on one attribute and then maybe roll five on a, on another one because you really want to get something good Ooh. and you move it around but the fates can still be unkind oh, yeah, no it's... matter how many <laughs> dice you roll <laughs> the odds are still uh, sort of not in your favor <laughs> no mm -hmm. all right so how about let's go ahead and um for the point by and for the rolling method let's go ahead and get our stats so we can figure out where they're gonna go and we're ready. So I have accomplished by clicking some buttons. <laughs> I am ready. I have stats. Awesome. I do as well. Oh, my stats are horrible. But you know what? That's okay. I can deal with that. 
That's yep, the good I, news yes, is that yes, uh, go for it, man. we are not playing these characters right now. So <laughs> That's true. So, uh, yeah, actually, I did pretty well. I've got everything's at least above a 10, but I've got nothing above a 15 either. So it's that sort of, eh. Um, and uh, I actually, because I just listened to uh, the uh, Mike Merle's uh, little video on dwarves, was going to play a dwarf as well. So that we could nice. use later maybe as potentially a some uh, some group backstory when we get to uh, that point in our uh, broadcast. Oh, there you go. Awesome. Let's see. So I am probably going to go with, uh, I'm, I'm kind of between a monk and a barbarian. I think, you know what? I think I'm going to go with a monk on this one and I'm going to make him human. I was ready for you to say that you are also going to make them a dwarf, but <laughs> that's not what you said. No, I'm okay with it though. Yeah, that's okay. So why dwarves guys? Why, why does that appeal to you? Like I said, literally, I just, uh, listened to the sort of history of dwarves from Mike Merles, who's one of the creators of are the uh, one of the uh, creators of the current edition of Wizards of the Coast. And uh, I kind of liked this idea uh, that he was posing there about dwarves being uh, craftsmen of, you know, that their whole sort of society, religion, everything revolves around making themselves better at something and which plays into this narrative that I'm trying to build about a fighter who, as I said, has one of one of the most unique mechanics for showing the growth of a character uh, that I feel uh, in storytelling, which is unlike every other class out there that gets uh, feats and attribute increases at every four levels, fighters, for the most part, get them every two. So mm -hmm. to build the story of someone who is younger, a new adventurer, you know, level one, or I don't know what we're actually rolling up, but wherever we start, a young adventurer and being able to show with your storytelling this progression into a honed uh, adventurer warrior through these increases of your base stats or by taking feats at these uh, at levels. So I, I think it's a great way to tell a story with what is, like I say, considered to be one of the most basic classes, but for telling a story of someone coming of age, it can make for a very compelling narrative because you're actually seeing their proficiencies, their abilities, you know, feats that they might take that you can build into your story um, hmm. as the character grows, as your campaign goes forward. So you have a real reflection in your actual mechanics of your class with your storytelling. Oh, that's really cool. For me, it's just, it's where I started and it's where my love will always be. I say that like sitting here talking to you, I can look and I'll, I mean, again, it's great for the audio medium, but this is the first mini I used like 20 plus years ago nice. <laughs> and I still have it. And I will always love dwarves because of that. And that, I don't know. And sweet, sweet beards. <laughs> Good old nostalgia and good old facial hair. Mm -hmm. Nostalgia, but I can't do facial hair, so. <laughs> Not with that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on it. I'll think really hard. I'll just, like, really believe in myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And I think I'm going to go with half elf. Ooh. I feel like um, I'm not a good decision maker, and being half something means I had one less decision to make. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I know what I'm about. <laughs> <laughs> and you went with the true, like, combo class. Yeah. I mean, less so, I think, in fifth, but, you know, in the bard. I mean, back in the day, that was definitely like a uh, little bit of fighter, a little bit of thief, a little bit of wizard. You have a bard. Mm, pretty much, yeah. I think they can they do cure spells in this game, too? I'm not too familiar with the bard class in 5e. Don't know. Don't ask. We're about to find out. There you go. <laughs> I know. I apolo apologize for asking questions. Jeez, uh, come on. And I actually chose uh, human. Uh, it's interesting because in all my time playing Dungeons and Dragons, I don't think I've ever played a human. I've always played something else because, you know, I'm human all the time in real life. So why should I play as a human in Dungeons and Dragons? But 5th uh, edition is uh, is really nice with the, the human. Either A, 
I get plus one to every one of my ability scores, or B, I can take plus one to two of them, and then I get an extra skill proficiency and a feat starting at level one, which is pretty darn remarkable. I was going to say, you want to squeak out those mechanics out of your class race combo. Yeah, there, there's a lot of different ways to, to go about it, and I, I find myself min-maxing a little bit more than I desire because I really like diving into the actual character itself, but, you know, a little min-maxing never hurt anyone. <laughs> yeah, I think there's there's that balance of wanting to be able to play your character, but also, you know, the dice are the dice. And um, part of the fun, I mean, I always go to Travis uh, uh, from Critical Role, who, you know, had this really low score and he put it in Int. And it's what became one of the most sort of endearing features of his character, Grog, was his low intelligence for some of the really great role playing moments in the game. Um, and so don't let a low score or a group that all have the same low score <laughs> um, put you off. I mean, we're, I think we're all sort of embracing it now that, okay, you know, we are going to be, you know, this sort of real, uh, different sort of party. You know, you all, you normally have the, the wizard or a caster who's going to be your big, you know, your big tactical brain and be able to, nail those investigation and history and all those other checks as we get into skill checks here. Um, and, you know, make it part of your story. Yeah, definitely. Yes. No, no one uses a deck of many things like that unless they do not have a high intelligence. Group. Exactly. <laughs> all right. So each of us have now picked our race and I think for the most part picked our class and, um, but, Starting with the race, um, every race offers um, some mechanical benefits, too. So if we want to go through and just make sure that we've added all of those. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I will plug my plug D&D Beyond here, which is nice. Um, you know, a lot of this will autofill for you once you pick, um, which is nice uh, when you're going through. And, and this is where I don't know all the ins and outs of the levels, but I do believe that character creation in the for the basic aid the basic classes is available without purchase. Don't quote me on that. I believe that at least in some form you are able to create characters without uh without necessarily buying a lot of the extra add-ons that go on with it. I will quote you on that, Tall Squall, because that is exactly what I'm doing right now. Awesome. Great. So there you go. Uh, you um, heard it here, it, folks. <laughs> yeah, no. So it's a great tool for even if you don't want to go into the deep and, you know, I, I got lucky because unlike a lot of people, I hadn't bought all the fifth edition books. Uh, I had only oh, nice. bought a player's manual and basically a DM's guide and a monster manual. I hadn't bought a lot of adventures, wanted to have them in my repertoire. And when they came out, they had sort of a big, huge, just get it all. And I'm like, sign me up because it's Christmas. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's been great. Um, I will say this as, I mean, just, I know I'm plugging D and D beyond, but here's a really neat feature that they have. If you, you can create a campaign. If one of your, one of your members is, uh, does subscribe to it, they can create a campaign. And everyone that they invite to that campaign has access to everyone else's in that campaign's purchases. Hmm. Oh, so it's nice. just like your gaming group where you might have that between a whole gaming group, you might have the whole library. And if you brought them all to Saturday Night D&D, &D, you would have access. That is the same way that D&D &D Beyond works is oh. that any book that has been purchased by anyone in a campaign, once you have someone, you know, who uh, does that has access to the whole campaign library. Oh, that's really smart. So choose your friends wisely. Ask them to provide a list of the things that they have purchased before <laughs> yeah. you become friends with them. So you yes. can kind of, you know, weed out uh. those doubles. <laughs> that is, that's a horrible way to choose a player group. Just want to say. <laughs> yeah, it's a really horrible nope. way to choose a player group. Oh. But hey, there are worse ways. That's very that's true. true. That's true. <laughs> All right, so we got our races, we got our classes. 
And and one thing, uh, if somebody's completely not familiar with uh, the whole race class thing uh, that's prevalent in a lot of different role playing games, basically a race determines what you look like, what your cultural history is, and a class determines effectively what you can do, what you're good at, uh, things like that. Your job. Yeah, basically your job. All right. So I think I have everything for that. Oh, for humans, I get to. I'm going to go with the variant route. I believe, and do the two ability scores plus one and a feat. And I think I'm going to take the observant feat, uh, which is really sweet at level one. It, uh, let me pull that up quick here. So those that are not in the know can understand what I'm talking about here. Okay, so basically with observant, I get plus one to either uh, intelligence or wisdom. And since I'm a monk, I'm pretty decent with the, the wisdom on there so i'm going to add plus one to that and bump myself up to 12 um, which gives me a plus one modifier which is nice but also it adds plus five to your passive perception and passive investigation checks so when you're just sitting around and your dm tries to throw something sneaky at you you can use uh, passive perception in order to see if you can see that thing without having to make a roll so it's kind of nice that you get plus five off the bat. Oh, and on top of that, I can read lips. I don't even have to hear them. I just have to see their lips moving. And if I understand the language, I can know what they're talking. Very nice. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty sweet first level feat, I think. So I think I have all my stats set. All right. Are you guys all set on your stat placements then? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, any, anything you want to point out about why you put certain numbers where you put them? It might be uh, interesting for our, our listeners to, to understand kind of the thought process of why some numbers should be higher than others for your class. I mean, I can go. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, because I'm being a fighter, uh, certainly want to either have strength or dexterity as my main stat. Being a dwarf, um, I do get a bonus to strength, so that sort of helped steer me towards what types of weapons that my fighter will use, uh, which would be weapons that are based off of a strength check as opposed to a dexterity check. Uh, what that means is that for things like axes, hammers, swords, you know, it's how strong you are, it's how hard you can swing the sword. But there is also something in the game called a finesse weapon, which would be like rapiers or uh, things that Take finesse, daggers, rapiers that you can use your dexterity instead because it's your skill and precision that determines the damage that they do. Um, so there's a lot of people, there are both uh, brute warriors, uh, fighters in this world, but there also are uh, more trained uh, finesse uh, style warrior, uh, fighters in this world. And so, uh, but because of being a dwarf and kind of fit into the mythos of dwarfs, um, I uh, went ahead and put mine in strength. Um, as I was telling, I kind of want to tell the story of this coming of age of my character. Um, I had one of my scores was a 10. I was like, okay, so where do I want to put that? Um, and since I'm going to play a young character, makes sense that it helps me tell my story. So I put the 10 in wisdom. He's a kid. You know, he's, he's not too world uh, worldly. He's probably grown up in his, with his, inside his dwarven clan, maybe not traveled a lot. Um, doesn't know a whole lot of the world. And so I went ahead and put my lowest score in wisdom to sort of help reflect and tell that story. Nice. How about you, Neil? I, and it, uh, and you kind of alluded to it, Ryan. I mean, you always want to be mindful when you're doing your scores to definitely think about like the implications of what kind of character that is when they interact, but also what bonuses you're going to get because you've chosen a specific race and that you know, every even number, you get an additional plus to anything you would do with that stat. So for my wisdom, I went with 15 because as a hill dwarf, I got an additional point of wisdom. So then it bumps it up to 16. And... I went the opposite route. I, I have very low intelligence and I have a low dexterity because I feel like I'm going to be the opposite with my character in that they're an older dwarf that just didn't go adventuring, but for whatever reason, eventually, like later in life, felt the call 
to become a cleric. And now they're going out and they're adventuring for the first time. Nice. Yeah, and uh, for myself, I, I went ahead and put my highest stat, 15, into dexterity, uh, knowing that I could give it an extra plus one because of being a human, so now it's 16. Um, and as a monk, most of your attacks uh, and everything is based around the dexterity stat. Um, and I believe wisdom is the, the secondary stat that monks uh, enjoy in this system. Uh, they get a lot of uh, like key moves that are uh, key as K-I, uh, moves that allow them to, to do things like cast spells or do special abilities later on, uh, which is really interesting. Um, but I wanted to utilize my really horrible rolled stats, my seven and two eights. So I actually put seven in for strength because I'm kind of picturing this monk as kind of a feeble person who walks with a cane and looks totally unimposing, but when combat starts, moves with a, a, an agility and deftness that you really don't expect. Um, so I kind of put these the strength, intelligence, and charisma as my lowest scores to, to kind of uh, offset that. Um, so he's kind of pretty decent in combat, but you wouldn't really expect it looking at him or interacting with him. I chose to put my extra stuff into charisma because um, that's I'm, I like playing face characters, charismatic characters. It's just kind of what I prefer to do and usually what I'm what I enjoy doing most. Um, and part of why I chose a bard because they tend to be sort of the face of the group and most of their abilities kind of key off of that charisma stat. Um, playing musical instruments, um, any of the spells that they cast, that kind of thing. Very cool. And we just got a few other things uh, to tie up, it looks like. Uh, skill choices. Each of the classes that we have chosen have a different list of skills to choose that, that we will be proficient in. Um, and then uh, just some equipment choices. And then we can get on to the meat of our characters, the, the backgrounds. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We will be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the Block Party Podcast Network and can be found at www.blockpartypodcastnetwork.com slash character creation cast. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, our guests, some of our character sheets, and other shows on the network. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at Creation Cast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. <laughs>